Building a business is a path fraught with difficult decisions. For every hard-won success, there are equally hard lessons learned. Fred Smith gambled FedEx's last $5,000 to save the business. Henry Ford went through two bankruptcies before founding Ford Motor Company. And for Rob Lacasio, bouncing back meant doing the unthinkable. I made a decision to restructure the company to get profitable. And that meant laying off 140 out of 180 people. So firing, you know, 70% of your company in a day. I've never did that in my entire life. Rob is a multi-time entrepreneur, inventor, dad, and avid pecan enthusiast. And in 2001, Rob found himself in the role of captain on a sinking ship. His conversational AI company, Live Person, was in the eye of a storm, and Rob needed to act fast. You know, hope is not a strategy. We had to deal with the reality of the situation. There was no more money to raise. We were losing customers. The internet was collapsing, and we needed to just stay alive. So I made a conscious decision to stay alive. Entrepreneurship often feels like one stumble after another. It's not easy on the company or the people who dedicate themselves to it. So how did Rob and Live Person bounce back? What X factor did they lean on to get themselves through hard times? I'm Jeremy Bergeron, and this is Business X Factors. Each week, we'll take a look at the secret sauce that takes companies to the highest levels of success and how they got there. We'll explore how these organizations are run and what's special about the people, culture, and processes that make it all happen. Before Rob founded Live Person, he had $50,000 in credit card debt that he took out for a business idea that didn't exactly work out how he had planned. I had about five grand and I got a small place and I started to sleep on a couch and I became very depressed. Rob had started a company in the early 90s that made information kiosks for college campuses. Picture these physical touchscreen hubs where students could stay informed about what was going on at their college. Rob charged companies to advertise on them. And at first, it seemed like things were going great. I've got about six or seven kiosks up at college campuses. I'm really proud. And someone calls me up and says, can you build a website? Now, I'd seen that web in 93 and I thought it was a joke. It was text links and we were doing, here I am doing digital video graphics on a, on a computer with a touch screen. And I thought, I thought, oh man, this is going to take over my world because a student could access this website from their apartment, not go to a kiosk sitting in the middle of a student union building. And right at that point, I knew I got to get the hell out of the. <laughs> so I, I, I literally got out of the kiosk business. I moved to New York City and then I was broke. Thanks to the internet, Rob's entire business model was about to go the way of the dinosaur he needed to pivot fast. Shortly after sleeping on that couch, Rob honed in on an idea far ahead of his time, a conversational artificial intelligence tool where you could type whatever you wanted into that chat box and the AI can process that information and respond. What is Live Person as it exists today? Like how has this company changed since, you know, founding it in the mid 90s? So we were always considered like a channel of communication, which was chat. And we were another part of like, there's voice contact centers and there's email and you can chat with somebody. Rob actually holds the patent for providing web chat for companies. He invented it in the 90s. I looked it up. It has a title that just rolls off the tongue. Method and system for customer service using a packet switch network. But today... What Live Person does is radically different from what it did in the 90s. What I realized, like asynchronous messaging, so like we do with our friends and family on Facebook Messenger and all that, I, I realized seven years ago, like that's not just communication. It's kind of an always on, call it asynchronous connection. So I was thinking like if a brand could always be on and in the pocket of the consumer, 
it kind of changes the game because every way they connect is asynchronous. You call, you ask questions, you hang up, you put on hold, you send an email, they get back to now, even chat, you're done, you come back, you have to state everything again, who you are and all that. But if you're constantly connected to a brand, they could do a lot of cool things over that. They could do selling and servicing, they can run automation and bots and all these things. So, you know, the world I envision is a world in which primarily the machines are powering the conversations you're having with brands and not humans. Because consumers don't really want to be put on hold. They just want to have the information, want to connect with the brand, they want to buy things. And, and we allow them to create this very personalized feeling by doing that over a messaging AI framework. And it's that personalized feeling that has really changed everything about how brands are able to communicate and interact with their customers. We know that the conversational framework in your brain creates empathy. And so real connection is your brain asking questions, getting answers. So I always felt like the digitization of, of conversations is going to power commerce in the digital world. And that's the vision I've stayed with from day one. But just before day one, Rob wasn't feeling so starry-eyed. Before entering the world of AI, he had just seen the writing on the wall for his kiosk business, closed up shop, and was saddled with debt and an intense feeling of failure. I was laying on that couch and I was, I was really depressed and I was down and I lost my other company and I felt like I made a lot of mistakes with my first company. I tell entrepreneurs like I needed to lose a lot and I need to be very down in the dumps to put my ego aside to be open to thinking differently. But Rob didn't all of a sudden rise from the ashes like a phoenix in a movie. He still had a lot to learn, and he needed to figure out how to reframe what was going on. To do that, this digitally focused guy turned to a very old school analog strategy that helps him find perspective to this day. I've kept journals all the way through, and I write what I've been feeling. And if you open those journals, you would think this is a person who's like on the edge of suicide. Like that's the life of an option. <laughs> I mean, they're like three quarters. It is like, I don't know what's going to happen today. I'm out of money. Oh my God. I'm, I'm so, I'm just not smart. Oh my God. I, I don't have skill. Oh my God. I hired the wrong person. It's all these things. And I write a lot of prayers in that thing. Like, dear God, please just help me through this. Like I, I've written that over and over. Like, dear God, please just help me get through this. And I promise I won't make this mistake again. Wow. Yeah, that's so poignant because a lot of people think that, yeah, it's like, oh, entrepreneur, you know, sees the shiny thing and it, oh my gosh. And then it's like finds the right person and then the money starts rolling in and then they buy the Tesla and the house in Palo Alto. And man, what happens in between? So much goes on. And it's actually beautiful to hear that you went to dark places to find light in those places. At the core of being an entrepreneur, there's one guarantee. You will always feel uncertain about what's going to happen. Will this idea actually work? Will customers use it? But Rob says that coming to grips with that feeling and learning how to respond is what really matters. I had a lot of uncertainty as a child. And what a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize, they may, they may have the same uncertainty. Take Steve Jobs. His mother and father gave him up. We all know the story about his life, but what did that do to him to make him want to be an entrepreneur, to take control? And so a lot of times I would say for entrepreneurs is like, a lot of times people want to stew in there, like you kind of sit in your childhood for a second, like, well, if everything was just perfect, maybe I would have made better decisions. And I flipped it around. All the uncertainty you had as a child helped you prepare for the uncertainty if you want to be a great entrepreneur. So a lot of times the negatives can be massive positives for you but it's how you perceive them. You know, when they hit you in the face and I had a lot of them, I mean, straight out blows to the face, but then I wake up in the morning for some reason and I see it a different way. I, I, I wrote, you know, I have my, I have sort of these principles I wrote out in 90, you know, the, basically when I was on the couch and it says, you know, nothing ever begins and ends in a day and I will not evaluate conflicts in the day. So there's nothing better than going to bed and then waking up in the morning, you'll find you'll have a fresh perspective on something that looks dire. And just about five years after the launch of Live Person, things would get very dire. 
The business was falling apart and there was some really challenging decisions that needed to be made if this company was going to survive. There's two types of tough decisions. There's one of letting go and there's one of committing and going in. In the year 2000, Live Person had grown to reach a major milestone. They would take the company public. But the timing was, well, unfortunate. This was on the proverbial eve of the second dot-com crash. I was one of the few CEOs that sort of made it through that. I mean, we went public in, in April 7th of 2000. Tomorrow would be 21 years of being public. Wow. I remember that day we went public and we went out at $8 a share, $300 million market cap, $2 million in revenues. And we were the last internet IPO. I mean, when we went public, it was Friday. And the bankers who took us public said, they had to cut the deal in half just to get us out the door because the, the internet was collapsing. The internet IPO market was collapsing. So either go public and get half the money you want at half the valuation or you're done. So we just, we did it and we went. A year later, things weren't looking so great on the balance sheet. Rob had to do something pretty drastic. I made a decision to restructure the company to get profitable. And that meant laying off 140 out of 180 people. So firing, you know, 70% of your company in a day. I've never did that in my entire life, but that, but I dealt with reality. As Scott McNeely, the, the founder of Sun Microsystems said, you know, hope is not a strategy. I remember him saying that back then, like hope is not a strategy. We had to deal with the reality of the situation. There was no more money to raise. We were losing customers. The internet was collapsing and we needed to just stay alive. So I made a conscious decision to stay alive. Were there some pretty instrumental mentors at that time? I mean, you're talking big decisions. They're coming quick. You can't exactly sit on these for too long. You're about to IPO or you're post IPO and you've got to make some moves. Like, did you have some support navigating that? You know, look, I, I had, back then I had a coach. So I, I vote, and I believe entrepreneurs, you really should get a coach because it's hard to always use like your board of directors or your friends and family or your loved ones as support. It's sometimes just so burdening for them. <laughs> I, I, had, I had a coach who I would throw things off of and, and she, she was really good. The one story which, which I will never forget is that when my CFO and I gave to the board the restructuring plan to let go of 75, 80% of the company. And I remember the board was like, this plan's ridiculous because <laughs> what do these people do today? <laughs> And I, I really didn't know, as in, not that I didn't know what people did. I was a very, I've always been a hands-on CEO, but I was like, I don't really care what people do. Like, we just can't survive. We're going to, we can't, we're going to go out of business. So it doesn't matter what anybody does. We just got to like do what we're going to do. So we, we had this debate at the board and the board was like, okay, if it made sense. There was a logic to it. But I had this board member at the time called Bob Matchlot and Bob, he was originally his vice chairman of Seagram's and uh, Morgan Stanley, a big banker guy, amazing guy. He was on the board of Disney. Like he was a CEO of Gillette at one time, like a real heavy hitter guy. And he grabbed me. I was 33, 34 years old at the time. And he said, I want to just give you some advice. He goes, that plan of firing all those people is a really hard plan. And you've never fired people and stuff. And I can tell you, it's, you, it, it's going to be a very bad day. He goes, I don't know if you're going to make it. He said, because we, we had a list of like 12 things we had to do perfectly, starting with firing all these people. Then we had to like, we had to do all these other things, get out of our leases. And he said, I don't know if you're going to make it. But he said, I'm going to give you one piece of advice because you're very young. He said, just don't bullshit them. Tell them the truth. You got it. People are going to look at you and they're going to remember you for what you say. And if you bullshit them, that's what they're going to remember. So just tell them the straight scoop. You got to let them go. Tell your shareholders, it's not pretty. Like, but just don't try to make it better than it is because it's not better and people can smell it and they'll respect you. But he goes, you may not make it, but at least you're going to have a long career and you want to be able to continue forward with your career. And I thought, you know, it's kind of the way I've always kind of lived it. I think you just can't bullshit 
Rob took that advice and he made those big moves. But what's interesting is that part of the reason Live Person was so strapped for cash at the time, so strapped, it had to lay off 70% of its workforce, is actually one of the main reasons the company is so successful now. I made a big bet that I didn't think the chat business, which I, I invented in, in 1997, I didn't think it was going to where I wanted to go. So I made a big commitment to stop developing there and to bet heavy in developing into messaging and AI. And we cut our earnings in half as a public company. We said, we're going to spend half our cash flow and, and shareholders didn't like it. And we went to a deep winter and everything would look bad from the outside, but inside we felt like we were really making progress. And today we're a better company for it. So I think there's the times where you got to let go. And there's the times where you got to invest in. And there, there's like two sides to that coin. Usually when you close a, a door, you're going to open a door. But you got to close the door sometimes to open a door. Coming up after the break, Rob tells me what he thinks Live Person's X Factor really is. We hear of a product launch gone bad, then great. We talk about what conversational AI will look like for Rob's kids. And we learn about how he's using the technology today to order one of his favorite snacks. Stay with us. Rob has been building and operating Live Person for over two decades. He's navigated the company to massive success, but each product launch still reawakens that anxiety every entrepreneur knows so well. No matter how many times you've done it, sending your idea out into the world can be terrifying but you can't let that fear stop you from pushing ahead. Eventually, your service or product has to launch. And Rob has a very succinct philosophy about that. Always get it out, push it out quickly. Don't worry about all the problems. You'll always fix the problems. It's a bigger problem not to put it out. In 2016, LivePerson partnered with T-Mobile to launch a new service. It let T-Mobile provide customer service directly to its users via in-app messaging. This is something that feels commonplace now. And quite frankly, Live Person is to thank for that ubiquity. But back in 2016, this was cutting edge stuff. And the rollout didn't go as planned. The day of the launch, in the, we were launching at five o'clock in the afternoon, Seattle time. And somewhere on like a 12 o'clock call, Someone on the team on T-Mobile side said, we don't have enough agents to staff 24 hours. We didn't plan for that. And they were like, well, we can't do this. Somebody said, we, we shouldn't do this day. We shouldn't launch. It'll be a bad consumer service. I said, I'll get you the people. Wow. Like I called up another group that we have and we also, I'll get it on my dime. I don't care. But do not ever stop. Rob and his team made the launch work, and today, those in-app and website chats are literally everywhere. And AI is powering much of the work those chatbots do. In order to make sure that the AI aspect of Live Person's offering was the key element and one that actually had a positive impact, Rob had to make yet another drastic move for the company. So I, I made a big decision on a hire a, a little over a year ago, and I, I swapped out my CFO. And I put in a data scientist as a CFO, a public company CFO. Wow. I haven't, I never heard of that. Never heard of that. That's what so like, it's kind of like no public company experience, none of that, which I knew we could train him in that because I, I've been doing it for 20 years. So I kind of understand what it's like. And, and we have a board of directors. I've got a, an audit chair who's been also can support them. And we've got controllers and we've got all this. So but I thought the really cool thing is if we bring AI to our internal operations. The CFO is John Collins. He came out of MIT as a data scientist. He ran a hedge fund and built models to trade stocks based on big data. Now he's helping live person transform how they work by using AI to change things like how sales are done, how data is collected and organized. Most corporations wouldn't take the risk of giving the CFO role to a data scientist. But by now, we know that Live Person doesn't stick to the traditional corporate path, and it's working in their favor. With the right leaders in place who encourage innovation and the technology to make that innovation possible at their fingertips, 
LivePerson's employees started delivering solutions that had big name companies knocking at its door, especially in times of need. So what do companies come to live person for, right? How are, how are companies large and small finding live person, implementing conversational AI, right? To make their business better. Well, first of all, like during COVID last year, what we saw was a mad dash to automate at, at high quality, high quality conversation. I hate the word bot. Most bots are like, they're just poor, but we try to create, you know, and, and give the ability through our platform to create very high quality conversational AIs. One of these conversational AI bots is called Pepper and was built for a little brand called Chipotle. With Pepper, you can order a burrito just by typing into Facebook Messenger as if you were ordering it at the counter. They could go and pick it up at the door and Pepper helped them build a burrito. So there's a lot of cool things we have out in the market that make communicating with their automation as high quality as a human connection which our name is live person. So we, we set a pretty high bar on what the quality of a conversation should be. And the bar keeps getting higher and higher because live person is exceeding expectations at every turn. So you talk about this, the AI component than the human component, right? And you've been quoted saying that conversational AI is going to have as much impact as e-commerce, search, social, right? Are people comfortable with these conversations, right? Would they not prefer to speak to a human instead? Conversational commerce allows you to ask a question and get back that response, ask a follow-up, get back a response. So you're getting true personalization by using the conversational user experience. And that's where the future is going. Like my kids, their, their user experience is not going to be a website and an app. They're just going to talk it out. It, I need an Uber. Okay, it's coming. I want to book a flight to Italy. Okay, here's your choices. There's a lot to happen to make that happen at that scale, but that's the path we're on. Do you spend, you, know, you and your team, do you spend a lot of time thinking about the the experience someone has? I mean, I'm sure there's like the flow of the conversation, making sure that, you know, the response is accurate, they get what they need. Are you thinking about like, what else can happen in that interaction besides just me, you know, typing something that I want and getting a response and getting there? Are you are you thinking about that, zooming out a bit and thinking, what else could we do with this with this experience? Yeah, I mean, look, the way we're putting it together, and we've we've got a, a platform out there, another platform called Maven, and and this platform is a true conversational commerce platform. So it sits above Shopify, so you can be a Shopify merchant and plug into it. And it allows for full end-to-end -end commerce, as in you can, I, I'm looking for something. It shows potential you know, products. It's got the catalogs built in. I can look at it. I can ask a question right there of someone who bought this product previously or the community around this product or of the brand. It's right in the messenger. I can get answers. I can then hit buy. It gets bought. Then it tells me, oh, it's shipping. It gives me the updates on shipping. Then, hey, it arrived. Okay, it's arrived. It's in my and then I can text back. Hey, something happened, or I just got pecans. There's a guy who's selling these pecans from a farm in Texas. I love pecans. These are really good pecans, and I saw them on Maven. And I, so I got, I bought the pecans, and actually, I just bought another one. They just arrived today. And at the end, it says like they're at, they're delivered at your door in the messenger. These examples just scratch the surface of what this tech can do, and I think sums up this idea of letting machines do what they're good at, and letting humans do what they're best at which is the core of what live person has learned through all of its ups and downs and pivots. Oh, and by the way, Rob says when he gets his pecans, he always writes a thank you note. And by the way, I really like your pecans. It's a farmer. Like they're really, they're fresh. They come in these great fresh packages. My kids love them too. The guy writes back, the farmer. The farmer's like, I really greatly love them. You know, our family's been doing this for like 30 years and like it's all interconnected. I didn't leave, I didn't leave the messenger. I didn't go to a website. I didn't get an email promotion. Uh, you know, text here, it's all just stays within one framework and it's easy. It's like, it's easy. That, that's that. So we're, we're, we're bringing these things to market. So that's how I envision it. it's all real easy. An easy experience with AI? No, that's not something out of a movie. It's the world we live in today. And those experiences are powered by live person. What makes it even more impressive is that we know that the journey to get to this moment has been anything but easy. 
Rob has gone from archaic kiosks to lying depressed on a couch to laying off 70% of his workforce. But through all the ups and downs, he stuck to one core philosophy. So what do you think is your like live person? What do you think is the biggest X factor today? The X factor for our company is where we're, it's, it's, it's a really odd company in many ways because people say when they come here, it feels like a startup, but we're not a startup. You know, like we're, we're a public company. We we're close to half a billion in revenues and almost a $4 billion market cap. And it's, it's not a startup anymore, but people feel like they feel that energy and the people we track to come here are on very entrepreneurial. And so I just, I kind of, I, I'm really proud of, of us as a company and the energy of the company is about being an entrepreneur. And, and even though you're working in a company and you didn't start it, we, you can be an entrepreneur here. And we also, we bought a number of businesses over the years and the entrepreneurs have stayed. I'm really proud that a lot of them have stayed. I mean, we must have about seven or eight of them in the company today. And they're running different businesses. They're doing something because they can still flex the muscle of being on, but now they have resources. They, they have resources that we can go after big, big ideas without raising venture capital and worry about raising money and all that. So that, that's kind of what I think our X factor is. Rob started Live Person in 1995, and today he still sits as CEO, making him one of the longest standing founding CEOs of a tech company. He's faced everything from the bursting of the dot com bubble to the financial crisis, and now even a global pandemic. And it's all thanks to the tenacious startup mentality to never quit, always get things out the door no matter what. Learn how to live with uncertainty and pivot quickly. Never quit. If you're going to quit, I, I would say I'll quit on my on my high, but don't ever quit on your low. Work through the wall, get over the wall, go through the wall, or go around the wall, but don't ever quit at the wall. You've been listening to Business X Factors, brought to you by Highland. To learn more about Live Person, check out liveperson.com. And if you like this show, make sure you subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast app. We'd also be so grateful if you rated and reviewed us on Apple Podcasts, as this helps ensure that more listeners find this show. Thanks for listening. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, and I'll catch you next time on Business X Factors. 